Anyway, uh, tonight's about understanding who, uh, what God has done in our lives and how true he is. In spite of the fact that the world seems very, very certain of a lie and a lot of lies, and they will tell you that you are stupid, okay? In spite of that fact, this tonight is about you understanding that it's still just a lie, and God is still true. And not only is God true in some general sense, every single word he says is true 100%. And that goes from Genesis 1-1 all the way to the last verse of Revelation 21, 22, 22, yeah, that's right. Every last word is true. The Bible itself says every word of God is flawless. That's what this presentation tonight's on. And what I want to help you with tonight if it's been a trouble for you, is you might be in a Genesis dilemma because you might be a person who goes to school and gets told everybody knows evolution happened. Evolution is a fact. Evolution is just the, the way things... And you know what? If you believe that and you try to couple that with your Christianity, you're going to have problems. I know I did. So that's what this is about tonight. So let me ask you, are you facing a Genesis dilemma? Here are some questions you might ask yourself to see if you are. Did dinosaurs live before mankind? You don't have to answer. Please don't raise your hand. Just think about this, right? Were people who lived in caves who used simple tools and did not have Wi-Fi less smart than us? Right? Were stars formed before the earth? How about fossils and diamonds and things? Did, that, did those take millions of years to form? And uh, is the Bible actually in conflict with science? Think about that a second. If you answered yes to any of those questions, to that degree, you may be facing a Genesis dilemma. You may have taken in some of the lies around you, and the only reason you believe it is because really smart people told you it must be true. We serve a really smart God. He's a lot smarter than the smartest people. Every single scientist like me has to bow the knee before him. Everyone. And if you're watching on there, I know some of my friends, you told me you're going to be here tonight and you're not here. I'm watching you. <laughs> and you're going to have to bow too. I'm going to have to bow. We all bow before God because he's the greatest. He's the king and he knows exactly what he's doing. So this is my I love me wall. All right. This is my uh, di college and grad school and PhD diplomas and everything like that. And I'm not showing you this to say, hey, isn't Glenn great? No, that's not it at all. I just want you to know, not every scientist believes evolution. People will tell you, oh, all the scientists are agreed that evolution happened. That is a lie. I don't believe it. And I can show you hundreds of other people who are scientists too who don't believe it. Many of them I know personally. Many of them taught me what I'm telling you tonight. And tonight, I'm only going to go through the very little tiny bit of, uh, of what we're talking about here. Tonight, I really only have a little bit of time. And I'm going to talk to you, first of all, about my own personal Genesis dilemma. It was ancient starlight. You know, if the universe is supposed to be like 13.8 billion light years across, and a light year takes is how long it, uh, light travels in a year, that must mean that the universe is at least 13.8 billion years old. And how do you fit that into seven days, 6,000 years ago? Oh, my word. Is the Bible true? Because <laughs> I'm a scientist, right? And I'm taught this is what we believe. It's hard for scientists. It really is. Because you're told that everybody believes this. And if you don't believe it, you're stupid. Okay? And you can't publish something that says, I mean, something other than evolutionism. You have to stick with the party line. So it's hard for scientists. This was hard for me. You know what? I struggled with this for years, thinking maybe the Bible's true in a general sense about Genesis. Maybe it's not exactly 100%. You know, like everything else is 100% true, but, but Genesis 1 through 11, we got some problems with that. Well, a friend of mine, thank God, pointed this out to me, that when God created the trees... He created them, and he used, there's a special Hebrew word that's used that potters use. He bara them. That means that he created by stretching out. And so they weren't, he didn't put trees in the ground on day three, and 40 years later they were full-grown full trees. No, he put them in the ground, he stretched them out. He bara them. The Bible also says God stretched out the heavens. That means one time they were small, 
and then he stretched them out and they became big. Now, some people might call that the Big Bang, but what I'm telling you, God stretched out the heavens. And when he did, that's what left behind all this redshift and all that light behind there. It didn't take 13.8 billion years to get this big. God did it. For me, that was overcoming that Genesis dilemma. So if you have one tonight, I hope I'll be able to help you get through that. All right. So we only have time today for just a couple of questions. First question that's very important. Is the Bible in conflict with science? And the second question I want to talk about tonight is, what about the millions of years? What about deep time? What about billions of years back, way back when, you know, all that stuff. You hear it over and over and over again. People always tell me, well, the reason you don't subscribe to evolution is because you don't know very much about it. No, I'm sorry. I hear it every single day, every day. And so do you. You watch TV shows. It's on there. It's on commercials. It's, it's, all, it's on people's T-shirts. It's everywhere. We know a lot about evolution. So what about those millions of years? Let's start off talking about the scientific method here because I want to show you that the Bible is not in conflict with science. Here is the scientific method for operational science. This is the method that all scientists use, and every time I get into conflict with someone who wants to tell me about atheism, they try to tell me how the scientific method works as if I hadn't had like 18 years of school figuring this out myself. But here it is. Sorry, sarcasm. Sorry, I'm, I'm working on this. God be gracious. Thank you. Uh, you start out with, I mean, this is a circle. You can start out anywhere. But let's say you start out with a theory. You start with an idea of how the universe works. And then you test it with an experiment. You put the chemicals together. It blows up. And yay, you won, but you died. Well, anyway, uh, you, you have an experiment you can test the results of. You can do it over and over and over again. And then your friends can do the experiment. And they can say, yeah, he's right. Or no, he's not right under these circumstances. That's what it's all about. Then you observe the results of those experiments. You take notes. You figure out what it says. And then you interpret the results of the experiment. One little catch. This interpretation phase is kind of like wearing a pair of glasses. So if you have a pair of glasses, if your glasses are good, you see one thing. If your glasses are bad, you see another thing. So if I have a pair of glasses and I put those on, I'm going to see differently than I saw before. So the interpretation is like a pair of glasses that you wear. And somebody might say, oh, no, science is absolutely objective. That is baloney, OK? Because there have been differences on theories for as long as there's been science. Back in the 1860s, scientists did not believe that rocks fell from the sky. Because how could rocks get up there in the first place? Right? They didn't understand that meteorites actually were happening. And they thought, oh, there's atmosphere. The Royal Academy of Science kicked people out for believing in meteorites. Well, they were wrong because they interpreted it wrong because they had a different interpretation. Everyone has an interpretation. So that's operational science. That's how we do that. People say, well, creationism isn't science. Well, guess what? Creationism isn't operational science. It is, however, forensic science, and so is evolutionism. Both of them are talking about events that happened in the past. Just like your murder mystery, you can't go back and say, hey, could you kill him again so we could see how you did it? You know, you can't do that. And when you're looking at the beginning of the universe, you can't go back and say, well, let's, let's see that one again. Uh-uh, it's too late. So for forensic science, you can't do experiments. Not in the same way you can for chemistry and physics and all those other things. You can't do those experiments. You can't repeat it. So you have to kind of guess. And you guess by looking at what you can see in the universe. You make those observations. And you can do tests to see if those observations are consistent in their results and stuff like that. That's fine. But you're going to interpret, and you're going to interpret based on something you already believe. I want you to understand that. You always interpret based on something you already believe. It might be the Bible. It might be something else entirely. It might be man's ideas. So I want you to understand that the Bible and science are not in conflict. Because what's really in conflict is evolutionism and creationism. And notice I put the ism on the end. Ism, what does ism mean? Anyone know what an ism is? It's a belief system. It just means I believe in creation or I believe in evolution. Creationism versus evolutionism is the, is the big deal. And the glasses you wear here is the glasses based on the Bible, God's word. That's where I start. Someone should do not listen to someone who says, oh, well, can you argue with me about that apart from the Bible? Don't do it. Because that's where we start our reasoning from. They start their reasoning from there is no God. That's a start. I should just as easily come up to them and say, can you argue that without the belief that there is no God? If they could do that, then it would be fair. But that's, they're not going to do it. What's even worse 
is what you believe about the existence of God will determine, even before you start talking about it, what you are able to interpret out of what you see. Some people are like fish in water who don't know that they're wet. I have, only, I have talked with a lot of atheists, evolutionists, and people who do not believe the Bible. I've only met one lady, only met one person who was a lady, who actually was able to admit that she had a worldview ahead of time that she was putting on and saying, I'm starting out from the position of not believing God. Every single other one I've talked to said, oh, no, I start with the data. No, you don't. No one starts with the data. You start by believing something. And you either start by believing God is who he says he is, the Bible is what he says he is, it is, or you start somewhere else. And that's why they come to the conclusions they do. And they don't come to the conclusions because the data tell them what to say. The data don't tell, say anything. People talk. The data doesn't talk. Okay, so how do you know if the set of glasses you're wearing is the right set? Well, I go, get, go to the eye doctor. You'll see one of these, right? And if your glasses make the eye chart look like that, maybe you need to get new glasses, right? If, the gla if your glasses make the eye chart look like this, then you might be seeing the right thing. So this is what C.S. Lewis says about this. I love this quote. I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, the sun, but because by it, by the sun, I see everything else. In other words, folks, we believe in the Bible because it makes sense of everything, doesn't it? I mean, before I really understood how important that was, I didn't understand how the universe fits and why we're here. Ask anyone to explain the problem of evil. Why do we have evil in the universe that people are basically good? No one but Christians can explain it. Really? The Bible makes sense of everything. So I want you to understand, for us, this is not optional. The Genesis account is a given. We interpret our observations of nature by the Genesis account, not the other way around. We don't start and say, well, look, maybe the Genesis account is wrong. No, that's our, actually our basis. And there's actually nothing wrong with having a basis because you look at the eye chart. And if the eye chart looks fuzzy, if the world looks fuzzy because of your view, worldview, then you go and say, well, maybe my starting assumptions were wrong. But you know what? I've looked a long time, and I'm very, very happy with my starting assumptions, and I just get happier all the time. Not because I don't question them, because I do. I am a scientist, and I do question things all the time. And I talk with people and ask them questions, and they help me. So just want you to understand, there's not room for two sets of glasses. You do this, you won't be able to see. Wear one set of glasses. Here's the deal. So, can we compromise? Well, can't we just compromise on a literal young day, six day creation, young earth creation? Couldn't God have just used evolution instead? You've probably heard these before, right? Can't, can't the Bible and evolutionism be both right at the same time? Uh-uh. You do that, you've, you've abandoned Genesis to do that. You've abandoned God to do that. So I just want you to know, no, you cannot do that. This is not possible. You cannot fit the millions of years that are required by scientists to make their theories work because they don't work unless you have millions and billions of years to somehow explain how something so totally impossible, the evolution of life, could happen. You can't fit those millions of years into the Bible. Here's why. One day, the first day God created light, right? On the, the first day, evening and morning. When it says the first day, day one, when it says evening and morning, it's talking 24 hours. It's real simple. In English, Hebrew, Russian, Spanish, you name it. Whenever you do one day, or day one, the evening and the morning, that's 24 hours. There were six of them, and then a rest. That's all you get. Okay, Genesis is also a factual story. People say, oh, well, Genesis was poetry. It was written in a poetic style, blah, blah, blah. This has been actually disproven statistically. They took all the texts in the Bible and lined them up according to whether they were more like poetry or more like prophecy or more like a factual story that was told for information purposes. Guess where Genesis was? All the way on the story side, being a factual story, just a, and Abraham climbed the mountain. Same kind of thing. Genesis account of creation is just like it happened. This is how it happened. It's not a poem. So Moses did not have some oral tradition that he was passing along. He used written documents, and he said, this is the story of Adam. In other words, I'm copying now from Adam's scroll. 
This is the story of Abraham. I'm copying from Abraham's scroll to tell you this. He summarized written accounts. This is not like the Navajo that have this oral tradition, which is wonderful, but no one really knows exactly where it came from. Thousands of years pass. No, he had, a, or he had a written tradition from people who actually were their eyewitnesses all the way back to the very beginning. So Genesis, in that oral tradition, or in that, in that written tradition, records the family tree of humanity with the ages of people and how old they were when they had kids. So if you add all those numbers up and you go all the way up to secularly recorded history, you can get about 6,000 years. You can't get much more. So that's all you get, 6,000 years. If you believe in the Bible and say, I believe the Bible. Oh, yeah, I believe the Bible. We say that every Sunday. This is what you believe. You can't get out of it. Please don't try. Because if you do, you're just going to be wearing two pairs of glasses and making a fool of yourself. If creation took long ages, millions of years, this is really important, get this, please, then that means that for millions of years, people, thing, things, animals, people, whatever, were suffering, dying, being sick, and sin hadn't even come into the world. And the Bible says sin, death came in the world through sin. That negates the gospel. You can't do that and be a Christian. So this is important. If you don't believe Genesis 1-1, what will you think about John 3.16? If you decide to disagree with God on Genesis, on creation, what will you think about Jesus? Will you just say, oh, well, you know, God, that Genesis thing is wrong, but I, I get you on Jesus. I'm all the way with you. No, you can't do that. This is a whole thing. It all fits together. So we have to be together on this. So if you do believe the Bible, how are you going to answer these really smart-sounding people who have these degrees and stuff like that who tell you, well, actually... The uh, universe is 13.8 billion years old, and the earth is 4 billion years old, and there's dinosaurs were 65 million years ago, and all this other stuff that they are basically making up because other people told them because they have to fit their theories in the amount of time they have available. Don't they have some kind of proof of this? Well, it's called radiometric, radiometric dating, and that's a long word, and I'm not going to go into details about it, but I'm going to talk about one kind of radiometric dating. Who here has heard of carbon dating? Anyone heard of carbon dating, right? Anyone ever have, have someone tell you, carbon dating proves that the world is millions of years old? Any, okay, this is complete and utter bunk. Let me tell you why. This is, uh, carbon dating can be used to estimate the ages of living things, things that had lived. It can't be used to show rocks because rocks don't breathe, and I'll tell you how that works here. Here's, what, here's the way it works. We're up high above the earth now, and high above the earth, we have carbon-14, this is nitrogen, it gets struck by this high-energy radiation up, up in the heavens above the atmosphere. Sorry, this is technical. Bear with me, it'll be fun. All right, uh, that gives us carbon-14. It's radioactive, you can detect it, all right? So carbon-14, there's a lot of it up there, and it just get, gets struck by radiation, and it turns into carbon-14, and then that stuff falls down to the earth, and then as it falls to the earth, there we go, it gets absorbed by plants, and animals eat the plants. And so carbon-14 gets into living things. No rocks eat grass. So no rocks that didn't, co didn't come from animals have carbon-14 in them. Does that make sense? It has to have been living. It has to breathe. Once it breathes, it gets carbon-14 in it. What happens when it dies? It stops breathing, right? So it stops collecting carbon-14. So now, if the flood comes along, which it did, it gets buried up, and this tree turns into coal, the carbon-14 is still in it. Only here's the interesting thing. Over time, about every 5,700 years, half of it goes back to nitrogen again. So now we, can, now we have a clock. We can say, okay, how much carbon-14, if, if you know how much carbon-14 was there in the first place, and you know how fast it goes, and that, that that speed has stayed the same over history, then you have a clock. We don't actually have that, that good of a clock after, after all, because we don't know all those things for sure, but people rely on that, that clock. That's what carbon dating is. That's how it works. Now get this, this is kind of fun. What happens to coal? Well, some of it gets pressed down into diamonds. Diamonds are very hard. It's the hardest thing known to man, hardest natural substance known to man. So if diamonds have that carbon-14 in them, and they do, how can they be billions of years old or millions of years old? Uh-uh. Can't happen. 
Now, people will, I've read articles saying, well, the creationists are making this up because they don't use pseudoscience, blah, 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 and they talk on, on and on. Eventually, they say, well, the, the diamonds got corrupted, or the labs corrupted the samples. Okay, you can say that, but then that you have to say that's also true of your samples that you submit that say they're millions of years old. I'm sorry, you can't have it both ways. You have to be consistent here. So how can they possibly say this? It's because they have to believe. They have to have millions of years. If they don't have millions of years, then their theories cannot. Who would believe that life comes out of nothing? We stopped believing that in the Middle Ages. But if you have millions and millions of years, maybe you'll believe that lie. That's the, that's the hope anyway. All right, so how about fossils? How are fossils formed? Everyone knows it takes millions of years to form fossils, right? Millions of years. Well, let's look at that. Maybe not. Here's some graphics I got from AnswersInGenesis.com, which, by the way, if you like creation science, go to AnswersInGenesis.com. Very easy to understand. Ask any question. They have all kinds of answers there. So this is what you probably heard. The fish dies, falls to the bottom of the ocean, gets covered up with stuff eventually, and becomes a fossil. Now, how many of you have thrown out a chicken wing and it became fossilized? So you, let's say a, a bird dies in your yard and it becomes fossilized, right? A fish dies in your aquarium and it becomes a fossil, right? No, this has not happened. This is what happens. The fish dies, other fish have a feast, the fish falls apart, no fossil, nothing left. That's what happens when things die the normal way. But what we say, in, in, we're believing the Genesis flood, it's in there. And what happened is, you know, this poor fish is swimming around and all of a sudden, wham! It gets hit with hundreds of tons of, of, of rock from volcanic explosions and from the earth being torn apart at the seams. And it gets covered up in all this sediment. And there, there's nothing to eat it. Nothing's gonna, gonna get into that fish and stop it. That fish stays there, a perfect replica of what it was when it was alive. And get this, it happened so fast that this fish did not get to finish his supper. In the very act of eating another fish, that fish, so, that happened fast. He didn't choke on the fish and then sort of slow down, slowly fall. He died. And look, once you notice the fins, when you catch a fish, are the fins open like that? They always close because it's a muscle that causes those fins to come up. The only way those fins stay up is if they get buried, like wham, right away. So you can see fossils don't take millions of years to form. If they did, how would you get fossilized raindrops? These are raindrops. They stayed around the, the surface of the earth for millions of years while they hardened and the earth cooled. And then, no, raindrops. It, it doesn't happen that way. They were immediately covered with ash and sediment because of all the incredible things that were happening in the flood and post-flood. And they got, even though raindrops are very, very fragile, those rain droplets got preserved, just like this fish got preserved. Amazing. It happens very, very quickly. So don't be afraid of when people say this sort of thing. Evolution also has some problems of its own, and there's a lot of them. And, you know, I've talked with evolutionists about them. Everything I'm going to tell you now, if you tell this to an evolutionist, they'll pull up a website, which there's plenty of them. They'll pull up a website and say, see, no, this is creation science is wrong because of blah, 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 blah. They can argue all day long, and this is how it usually goes. Well, uh, evolution is wrong on this point. Evolution is wrong on this point. Evolution is wrong on this point. Uh, well, I, no, I don't know the answer to that question. And the evolution is wrong on this point. Evol oh, but back there, that one thing you didn't know the answer to, that's why creationism is wrong. It happens all the time. It gets nit nitpicked to death. Don't argue with evolutionists. Love them. They're lost. Love them. Right? Don't, don't feel like you've got to correct them. I have a friend who's like, somebody's wrong on the internet. Well, you know, we're all, we're all wrong, right? We, do, we all make mistakes. And don't fix them. Love them. And when you talk to them, don't, don't try to show them how much better you are than them. And, and don't let them get all insulted when they tell you you're stupid. You know what? They're the ones who are in trouble, not you. So let's love them. Because they need Jesus. They need Jesus. We all need Jesus. So here's some problems with evolution. Here's one of my favorite ones. The fossil record supports evolution because evolution is a fact. Because the fossil record supports evolution. Because evolution is a fact. Because the fossil record, I, you know, 
if you get in arguments long enough, you start to see these circles. They go argue for a long, long time, and they circle around, and they come back to, well, it's actually because of, because of the thing I started with. Here's another one. We know the fossils are old because we know how old the rocks are, because we know how old the fossils in those rocks are, because we know how old the fossils are, because we know how old the rocks are. Because we know, and, and it's very, very common to date fossils by rocks and rocks by fossils. I even, a friend of mine is, uh, Mike out there uh, and I went, we were going to submit a sample and see how it was done. And they actually ask you, how old were the rocks near the sample that you were going to do? Can you guys give us a hint? Because we want to, you know, anyway. Very common thing to be done. Some other real quick problems. Here, this, is a real, this is about 160 years old. Why isn't the sea already saturated with salt? The, the water, rain comes off the continents and goes into the sea. The sea doesn't have salt, well, it does have a little bit, but it comes mostly from the continents. It should be full of salt by now if the earth is 4 billion years old. If you're really, really generous with it and say, okay, the maximum rate of, you know, of change and stuff like that, all, all the, you can get 62 million years out of it, maybe, but not 4 billion years. It just doesn't work that way. Here's another one. How come the moon isn't further away? It should be at least three times further away than it is because, the, okay, you may not know this. I'm sorry, the moon is going away. It's about an inch and a half a year, but it's slowly going away. If you go back in time far enough, it should have been on the surface of the earth if you, ha if you use the, 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 the deep time that they're talking about. It should be about three times further away than it is. Since it's not, that means that if you play time backwards, it would have been on the surface of the earth, and that would not have worked well. So how come it's not further away? Well, the reason is because it's not that old. Sorry. <laughs> uh, how, okay. We all breathe turns out it's really convenient for life to breathe. Y you hear about silicone-based life forms in science. It, it, it doesn't. Look at your chemistry. Carbon is the way to go. It's like magic. And carbon-based life forms need oxygen. So if they tell us that we were the, the, the first life formed in a reducing atmosphere where there's no oxygen, a nice little warm little pool where there was nitrogen and all this other stuff, and blah, 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 blah. No, life cannot form without oxygen. It needs to respire in order to work. And if you have oxygen, you immediately destroy DNA. People like to say, oh, well, DNA came first. Well, maybe RNA came first, actually. And then we, well, if you have any oxygen, it gets destroyed. If you don't have any oxygen, it can't make anything. So which is it? Either way, you're wrong. How about in the beginning, God created? How about that? Works for me. All right? Thank you. You probably heard there's blood in... I feel this is late 90s, in, in T-Rex bones, 65 million year old T-Rex bones. Okay, maybe they're 65 million years old. How did they, I mean, if you had a 65 million year old steak, would it still be stretchy? It, let's say you put it in their fridge for 65 million years. Let's say you put it in the fridge for 500 years. 65 million years. So what was the answer? Oh, wow, we must have been wrong about our dates. No, the answer is, wow, somehow blood and connective tissue must be able to stay flexible for 65 million years. How is that? Amazing. They have to have the lie. Do you see why you need to love them? It's not that they're stupid. They are not. They are very smart people. Most of the evolutionists I know are much smarter than me. They have degrees. They understand this. They're good at arguing. They are lost and lost, as lost as they can possibly be without Jesus. They do not need us to argue with them. All I'm telling you this for is so that you won't feel stupid and let the way you feel about yourself govern what you believe, because it's not true. What is true about you? Whatever God says. That's what's true about you, not what anybody tells you. Okay, I'm way out of time here. Evolutionists seem uh, very certain. So, uh, honestly, there's lots of people who will admit that there are problems with the models, but they always appeal to some future time. You know what? That's a faith statement in the future. People who are less informed say, oh, evolution has already been proven. But that's just ignorance. They don't know there's problems. And if Christians and creationists say, hey, the secular scientists said there's a problem with their models, guess what? They get bashed. That's not science. That's just being ugly. So don't expect this thing to be fair. 
a lot of the criticism you get is name calling. I, I get it too. I have good friends who are, we don't name call or anything like that because we're a respectful relationship, but it will happen to you. You'll be in a conversation with someone, suddenly they'll find out you believe the Bible, you suddenly become very stupid. It happens. It's happened to me. Uh, I want you to understand, this is the cost of discipleship. If you would like to uh, be a disciple, you've got to be prepared to be faithful, even when you get treated unfairly. So this is why I'm telling you all this stuff. I say this so that no one will deceive you. Someone say deceive you with persuasive but thoroughly deceptive arguments. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and someone say empty deception. Empty deception. Pseudo-intellectual babble. I love that. According to the traditions and musings of what? Mere men following the elementary principles of this world rather than following the what? Truth, the teachings of Christ. And here's another one. My goal is that you may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that you may have the full riches of what? Complete understanding in order that you may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, why look anywhere else? Why look anywhere else? I'm out of time. I hope this has, in, has improved your faith. Remember, one set of glasses. Don't believe everything you're told. God bless you.